again, it's problem, not symptom, right? So you look at who are you recruiting, right? You've got to go all the way upstream and, and work on this. Uh, when you onboard an employee, what's that first time initial experience? And then when you're looking at uh, retention, why do people stay, right? What makes people come to your organization and then what makes them stay in your organization? But I think right now you've got to recruit differently. The, um, again, it's a white hot market. So if you don't want to recruit someone and onboard them, put an investment in them and they're gone in 12 months. I'm Devin Reed. And I'm Sheena Badani. And you're watching Reveal, the revenue intelligence podcast powered by Gong. Keep watching here to see the full interview. Or if you like to listen to podcasts on the go, check out the links in the description below. And if you like what you hear, subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify, or all of them. Why not? And while you're there, make sure to leave us a five-star review. We personally read every single one, and I think I speak for both of us when I say they mean the world to us. Could not agree more, Devin. Now, without further ado, here's the episode you've been waiting for. All righty, Jason. Well, uh, great to see you again. Uh, we're super excited to talk about, I think, a topic that's top of mind for every single revenue leader in the world today, which is really about how do you retain top talent? You know, it's been such an interesting time. Um, you know, there's uh, opportunity out in the world, and that also makes it challenging for a lot of folks to keep some the best of their best. So uh, that's what we're going to go deep into today. Uh, but before we do that, um, I was really impressed just looking at your profile on LinkedIn um, and the deep experience that you've had at BMC almost, um, you know, a quarter of a century, if I can phrase it like Jan that. January the 2nd, 25 years. Yeah. That's amazing. So tell us, tell us more about that and, and your path to CRO at BMC. Yeah, so I've been very fortunate, very blessed. I've had a um, magical run. I, I, I'm from New Zealand, and I started with um, my dogs chiming in. Started with um, BMC, first of all, as a partner um, down in New Zealand, and then I got my first gig with them in pre-sales, actually, software consultant in Australia. I um, was fortunate to, you know, at the time there were seven people in Asia Pacific doing pre-sales. Um, I think when I left about three years later, there were like 600 um, the sort of massive growth, you know, launched BMC in, in China and in Korea, um, you know, helped grow the business in Japan, Hong Kong, uh, Asia. And so got a really good APJ view of the world and then got offered an opportunity to move into R&D, which was like getting a lobotomy for me. Um, I literally had no idea what I was doing, but I, I think I managed to bluff my way through it. Did a couple of years in Houston doing that, working in, that was head office. Then came back to New Zealand and we acquired a few companies and I ran them and I uh, helped run them in APJ. And then 2008, 2009, got an opportunity to come up back to the States and work with um, John McMahon um, and his uh, sales methodology and sort of learn from a, a grandmaster. Um, and then in, they took like little promotions and then I ran marketing for a while and then I had an opportunity to go and run a mirror and, uh, for a bit and each time was you know, bigger gig, more complicated. Um, when I came back to the States in 2016, um, I was running the Americas and we, I had the opportunity, we did as a company about two years ago for about nearly 20 years, we we'd, we'd had bifurcated separate sales organizations, even though we were one company, different divisions, we didn't have a CRO. So um, uh, under the new ownership we were on, they said, why don't we go back to having a CRO? And I was um, fortunate enough to, to get asked and it's been, you know, fantastic, fantastic ride. And, I have a wonderful team, very, you know, seasoned veteran um, group of sales leaders. And that's a really important part when we get onto this retention topic because people tend to stick and stay if they like their leadership teams, right? You heard the, the old phrase about you leave because mm -hmm. of your manager. Often you'll stay because of your manager, all right? right. So um, you're, I'm very lucky about that and, and I've got a great team behind me as well. Uh, that's tremendous. I wish I could kind of like follow you historically in that journey around the world, like literally around the world, um, which sounds well, amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What did you learn along the way that you wish you knew sooner? Like, you know, kind of day one when you were starting. Oh my BMC. God, don't even start. You know, <laughs> first of all, you're going to make me out to be older than I am. But I, there's so many, so many times I will say to myself, geez, I wish I knew that, you know, back then. And, and, but the thing is, it's, that's the reality of, of, you know, experience, right? You, you're putting together like chapters in the journey or in, in your book for your career. And each, each chapter or, or location or job that I had, 
um, you know, was creating a profile. So I'll, I'll often have people say to me, why didn't you leave BMC? Well, if you look at the, every two or three years, I was doing something very, very different, all right? And I think at least three of those um, changes have been major transformations inside or driven or driving major transformations. I think it, from a sales leadership point of view, if you've driven a successful sales transformation, you understand what it takes to get through that, whether it's taking something from nothing through a startup to being you know, high performing sales organization, building it from scratch or taking something that's broken and re-engineering it. I think the biggest one it's a re sounds really, really basic, but problem identification or actually working out root cause of problem. Um, what having seen so many different things, um, you know, different geos and different roles and different jobs inside the company, um, I feel like now the, my spidey senses are like more tuned in to seeing issues and problems, right? So understanding that problem statement and then rather than getting fixated on a symptom, sales leadership might see something, let's take you know, retention again, they might see something around attrition and they might think it's, there's, a, there's you know, one or two people have left, there's a symptom, it's not the problem, it's a symptom and they try to firefight the symptom and all they're really doing they're not actually fixing the problem. They're just they're putting out little fires. They're not actually taking the fire completely away. So I think one of the biggest things I've learned in different roles is you know be a great listener, um, understand what it is people are going through and what they're doing. Um, you know, take inventory, take stock. Don't don't do anything in a rush. Many times I'll be going to a job. The person above me would say, "You need to fire that person and fire that person and keep those two. And then you find six months later you've done the opposite. Because the two they wanted to fire weren't given a profile or uh, the opportunity to actually do what they can do, mm. and the two they wanted to fire were actually bluffing, or they they weren't actually driving good practice or culture or whatever it is that was foundational to you building a great team. So, yeah, I've, I've you know I feel like you know a, I'm going to say I'm in the twilight because I'm an old bugger, um, but I, some of those lessons along the way, um, I feel like a lot of what I do now is about paying it forward. It's it's you know, the leadership team I have is amazing. All of them could be CROs, but don't recruit any of them. <laughs> any of you listening, um, that that they are they in their own right uh, veteran professionals, right? So I don't have any. Just recently, I've taken all the authority of approving deals, quotes, expenses, travel. I've given it to them. I don't need it. I trust them, and they're good at what they do, and they know what they're doing, and and they feel empowered because I've given them that ability. Right? It's very simple, but it was actually a, a no-brainer to do it. I love that. And speaking of, even if you try to headhunt Jason's execs and his leaders, let's talk about why they'd stay, right? So before we get quite too, too tactical there, you know, there's a, a nice a nice name, right? There's the Great Recession. Now there's the Great Reshuffle, right? And so attrition is a big challenge for sales leaders all the time. Uh, but right now there's record numbers of employees resigning. And that's kind of given us that, that nice coin statement, right? That, that great resignation or great reshuffle. What's your take on this shift, Jason? Well, first of all, um, it's real. Um, I mean, even for, and I think too, I guess probably before you start, last year for all of us was probably a year where none of us really had attrition. That right. last year was, you know, shelter and job um, or, or shelter in place. Um, and people did it, right? They were worried about, um, what was really going to happen with the pandemic? They you know, they were on health plans. They, for various different reasons, I probably I guess everybody in the, in the industry had no attrition or very little attrition, right? Um, but during that and towards you know the last you know six to nine months, the IPO markets you know I don't know I think it's forty six new IPOs in like the last four months, um, which means they're having to grow sales organizations. I'm just talking in enterprise software selling. So the market's white hot again. And what people have done when they've come out of shelter in place or shelter in job is they've gone the opposite. It's just, I just need to change. Even if some of them are really happy and comfortable, they're looking at their life, all aspects of their life with a different lens, and they're wanting to change. Now, some organizations may be um, implementing, you know, return to office policies that others don't like. And I don't know if the pandemic itself or, you know, people mandating change in their organization is causing an issue. It's more just people looking at their lives a bit different and saying, oh, I want I want a fresh restart. And and I, I get that. Um, by the way, we're not perfect. We've got attrition like everybody else. So what we're doing 
um, is looking at, again, it's problem, not symptom, right? So you look at who are you recruiting, right? You've got to go all the way upstream and, and work on this. Uh, when you onboard an employee, what's that first time initial experience? And then when you're looking at uh, retention, why do people stay, right? What makes people come to your organization and then what makes them stay in your organization? Um, and I think, you know, those are, you know, three different ways of maybe breaking down the major problem. Uh, re recruiting is a, you're going to always have to do that. I think right now you've got to recruit differently. The, um, again, it's a white hot market. So if you, you don't want to recruit someone and onboard them, put an investment in them and they're gone in 12 months. So there's a lot of people thinking in this space because it's very fluid, you've got to recruit properly. I think alternative recruiting methods are interesting. Um, there's a lot of work going on out there. Um, I probably won't show you that it's from the Harvard Business Review around, you know, how to spot talent. Mm. And it's saying, hint, experience is overrated because problems are different. Therefore, maybe the mindset of how you fix them needs to be different. Interesting. Um, so, so early stage talent and, and identification through university programs or whatever, that still want to be in the sales industry. Um, but then when you break, you know, why do they come to your company? They believe in what you're doing, right? They believe in the vision, the strategy. They love the manager that's recruiting them. And then for most other salespeople, what's my quota, what's my territory, and what's my comp plan? <laughs> it's kind of those five criteria. Do I love the company I work for and believe in what they're doing in the culture? Who's my manager? Quota, comp, territory, whichever way you want to mix it. Um, so how do you retain them, first of all, with that lens? Um, I think creating a culture of, uh, of learning if you get good salespeople, they're highly coachable. So you've got to want to, you know, teach them, right? And, and this is what I was saying before about pay it forward. It's not just individuals that you're recruiting and recruiting management teams or retaining management teams. They want to stay because they're getting developed. They're learning something new. They're doing something new. It's interesting when I look at um, the younger generation, these millennials that you're, you're recruiting, it's not necessarily just about the money. All right. It's about what am I going to learn and what am I going to do or how am I going to, what, what, you know, how am I going to make a change in the organization that I'm working with? Whereas maybe some of us older dogs, it's more just, you know, show me the money. So you, you've got to get that right retention balance. And we put a lot of effort into training programs and I'm not talking, let me tell you about my product. I'm talking about training you to be a better sales professional. So how to manage a first time, a first meeting, um, how, to, how to handle a difficult conversation, um, you know, etiquette around presentations, uh, presentation skill sets, and you know, um, learning general. It's interesting, but learning sales skills through understanding um, and using role play uh, as a form of educational training, and even through the pandemic, even by Zoom and, and and other online mechanisms, constantly giving the team the ability to learn and train not just in your product, but in becoming a better professional, develop their own skill sets. And I think even more so for the leadership teams, it's understanding, we run programs, um, we call one of them called Seven Wonders of Selling, right? So we teach the sales managers, you know, how to recruit, um, onboard, um, and uh, develop employees. And then we teach them, you know, forecasting skills, pipeline skills, you know, operating system and cultural skills. So the Seven Wonders of being a great sales manager. But just, just giving them that vehicle where they say, I'm always learning and I'm always getting something, you know, two-way feedback from working with you is, is really, really key. I was on uh, LinkedIn just this week and I saw a post from a sales manager, I think I think kind of on the newer side, and she wrote, uh, oh, so, oh, so nobody tells you how hard hiring is. That was, yeah. that was the whole point. And tons of comments and likes and I was part of it because I'm like, to your point, it's like most people, most folks don't really teach or most excuse me most companies don't really teach people how to hire and recruit and interview um well, let's talk about that that's actually so so there, if, if you were hired to be an inside sales rep or a bdr right not many bdrs because they don't normally get hired and say hey my my career ambition for the rest of my life is to be a bdr right yeah most of them then will say even if they're then inside sales i want a field sales job most field sales people, I'm not talking most, but uh, yeah, it's probably most, then will say, I want to be a manager. Mm. All right. So what takes you from being a great individual contributor to being a great manager? So 
this is part of the point you made about recruiting, is the very first time an IC gets promoted to be a first line manager and the very first time they have to go and recruit somebody outside the organization, into the organization, they don't have a clue. Yeah. And especially if, that, if they're recruiting salespeople, they all sound amazing. They don't know how to read a resume. They don't know how to verify and check experience. They don't know how to challenge the person in the interview process. They don't, they don't just don't know what they don't know. This comes back to what I was saying before about training and development. We offer our leadership training to our individual contributors. So before they be want to become a manager or they want to go from BDR to inside sales to field sales to manager, every stage there's management or there's development of them so that they get the next, the next benefit of going to the next step. The point is, if you know, hey, I'm going to be an IC for a couple of years, I'm going to do really well, but I'm going to get trained to be a manager. Now you've got a career path. Before you turn your head and look for another opportunity, you'll realize that if I stay for five years, I can go from inside sales to field sales to maybe first line management, five or six years. It gives you that career path. It takes that one thing away. Most people will go for the management role by leaving the company they're in right. to take a job somewhere else. And if you haven't had that training, you will fail, right? You will you won't be able to handle the pressure of recruiting and onboarding. So let's say you've got six people. Two of them have been here five years. Two, so you've got to look after and develop the long-termers. You don't want to lose them. They're highly skilled, very tenured. Two of those people are being here less than two years. You're still developing them into the role. And two of them are brand new. And one of them you just lost. As a manager, this is what you're dealing with all the time is this mix. Like, what I like about what um, how you're investing in your individual contributors is by giving them that management training, you're also showing that you're investing in them, that you believe in them. Um, and that probably, I would expect, also helps with their retention and their desire to stay at the company. It's differentiating for what for so everybody offers a, an, an OTE, a, you know, everyone can say, you know, here's your package. Probably right now, a lot of people are also able to say, here's your stock, you know, pre IPO or invested RSUs. So the maverick um, or the, you know, the person that just leaves for money or, or doesn't stay because of it is, you know, a, a long time sales leader taught me this. Don't make a decision solely based on that pure economic state. You've got to think of the other variables, the other components. So if you hate the culture where you're going to, again, if you don't like your hiring manager, or you don't, you don't have a, you know, some sort of parity on what six or what good looks like. And then lastly, are you going to be developed or is that the role you want to stay in forever, right? And I think, you know, I become like a little bit of a poster child for it at BMC because I've I've been gone through the journey, right? I've actually, and, 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 I, and I won't say I was trained every step to do it, but every time I would do it, I would think back and go, I need to train people on what I've just been through because the next person that takes this gig um, from me, it, it, I would only be as good as how sustainable it was after you left. So you're de developing and training people all the time. It's like I said about my leadership team at the beginning. I feel like I, you know, I could put any one of five of them into the role if I, I was had to, you know, step out for a minute or two, and and I would, it would the business would run. And that's actually what you try to strive for. You want to get to right, and and it will retain people if they fit. They're getting the comp, right? They're they're seeing a the future. They're being developed. They're being trained. They like the culture. Those become key elements in the retention. Great stories, Jason. I think it's really interesting. I think what I'd love to hear is kind of like, how do you identify that top talent, right? And I think there could be a couple ways. One could be the interview process. I think that's kind of the obvious one. The other is you've got a pretty big organization yeah. <laughs> existing today. How do you maybe identify, you know, the right people like, you know, for, for first time leadership roles or leaders who are ready to get into yeah, like, you know, point. that senior level? Yeah, so, so maybe I don't focus too much on the recruiting aspect of it because everyone's got their, like, you know, determination, great, IQ, uh, IQ EQ, yeah. you know, coachable. They've all got their own criteria that they apply and, and how they weed, uh, weed that out in, in the interview process. But I think in, if you've recruited well, especially if you can recruit, you know, not in play a talent into your organization and you can you know, create a, a group of, you know, a pool of A talent. And even if, when a B talent, a B or C talent comes in, they, they'll rise to the tide, and they'll rise up with the rest of the A talent. It's how do you identify where to go next in that talent pool? So 
you have to be very disciplined as a management team. This from the top down. So we do regular nine box um, reviews. So you know the nine box structure of top right hand corner is you know uh, they're what you call one talent. So you would the eminently promotable um, done the groundwork. You know got the performance collateral that says ticked all the boxes on the hundred percent here, hundred percent there. Um, I like to look for, um, this is kind of you know, lessons learned, did they create an initiative, all right, that become institutionalized in not just what they do, but people around them. So a good one might be they came up with some creative way to build pipeline, all right, or, or manage pipeline. Did they not only institutionalize it with their team, which means they're good at coaching and training, but did they make the ecosystem and those above them you know, did it develop through the organization? Did it become part of our DNA? So, you know, performance collateral, driven and owned an initiative that became important to the company. And the last one is, how's the ecosystem accept them? Right. So, you know, let, let's say, um, you know, Sheena was an absolutely, you know, oh, this is obvious, right? A talent. Um, Sheena was obviously um, you know, the best. She, the she, best. Her her back is tired because she's yeah, just so, carrying me all the time. You know, and then then of course, and then of course we had Devin. All right, um, but let let's say a promotion came up, and you know, um, I I decided to the ecosystem in the sales team. We all love both, but in the ecosystem, you know, Devin didn't play fair. All right, mm -hmm. Devin would. Put the lawyer. Yeah, you're sh you're not in your head. She's already like, yeah. Real. You, I, you, you put you the lawyers. The channel didn't like <laughs> him. The lawyers thought that he, you know, was demanding. But hey, wow! Look at these numbers. If you promote Devin, what message does that send to the rest of the ecosystem? Right, right, right. If if you do the wrong things, I'm going to promote you. The rest of the ecosystem goes well, what? So you, it might not sound. It, you know, I always say that. Going from individual contributor to first line manager, which is a big promotion, but the hardest that role is the hardest role uh, in sales because you, like I said, you're doing everything for the first time. It's it's when you get further up the tree or up the stack that those promotions send a message to the rest of the organization. All right, they really do. So, um, you know, identifying top talent, giving them the right development. If you, it's shame on you as a leader if you pick someone out of a pool because they're amazing. And you promote them and you sit back and watch them fail. It, nine times out of ten, it's you that created the fail, not them. All right. Because they didn't suddenly overnight become bad talent. Right. There's something that, unless they weren't coachable, there's something you did probably did wrong in that process. So that's actually looking in the mirror. You got to look pretty tough at yourself. I've done that a few times, right? Where I've maybe not been the promoting manager, but I've watched others do it and then seen the poor person who was top talent fail. Um, and it's just, it's a travesty, right? Especially if the person's have got tenure in the company. So you've got, it's a really important component. You know, what, what's their performance collateral? Are they, you know, and when they win deals, you know, do they go, Hey, I want it. And you guys didn't help. Um, you know, what sort of character do they have when they, when they, when they're behaving? Um, you know, what's their, do they, have they created an initiative and made it institutionalized in the company? And, you know, what's the ecosystem's acceptance of this person being promoted? Mm -hmm. I really love like that um, that point around the ecosystem. I'm curious to get your take like on another kind of conversation, which is how do you determine if somebody's ready for that promotion? There's either they're like they are already acting in that role, they're already doing the manager level responsibilities versus the potential. Yeah. So kind of like would yeah. love to get your take on that. Yeah. So so I actually think um, it's timing that's the important. Um, but part of this, you can see potential. Often, you'll see potential pretty early on, um, and it, it, you know, especially if you've done it a few times and you've watched it a few times, it's actually um, making sure they spend a little bit of time in the saddle, doing the role they they're doing before you, you know, you move them up and you burn them out. So, um, I'll give you one. This is a little trick that that we've implemented, and it seems to work quite well. So. I talked before about you know alternative ways to recruit. One thing that we're um, doing, and it might sound a little bit different to sales, is we're actually bringing in interns, right? And we're bringing in these interns um, over summer um, from locations where they want to um, uh, become salespeople, right? So 
Not many people go to college and go, all I want to do is be a salesperson. Um, you know, you normally bomb out and then you become, no, just joking. Um, so, so <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. I hope the audience is. Um, you know, I'm on mute, but I would have, I would have happily laughed a lot, mostly because I mean, I went to school to be an English teacher, and when I graduated, the first thing I did was jump into tech sales. So I did. Yeah, there you that. go. I mean, and, I'm and, laughing because like, I'm like, that's very. I, I'm an accountant. You can tell I'm an accountant. But I'm an accountant, but <laughs> it's just, you know, like so. so um, not many. There are programs now. There are quite a few in, in happening over in Europe, but they're popping up here too, where universities are offering um, graduate programs to be salespeople. And some of them yeah. are world-class, right? So they're right, but let's say you go and you pick these interns up. So let's say, again, we'll take, you know, Sheena is a high-performing individual contributor that's got aspirations to be a manager. Yes. Devin doesn't. So so Sheena um, has done this early stage training. So we've got these early development, you know, we we'll talked about seven wonders of being a great sales manager. So we've We've opened Sheena's eyes up a little bit too. This isn't as easy as it looks, right? And often when people go through this training, the first thing that happens, Sheena, is they go, that's why you asked me to do that. So it's like it's mm -hmm. sort of you have an aha moment, right? So you're getting this development and we're working with you. So let's, let's, let's prove this out. Let's test this out. Let's bring an intern on, all right, over the summer. And Sheena, as an individual contributor, now has to manage an intern, all right? So only for eight weeks. That's all it is. Right? Mm -hmm. You've got to set goals, create a plan, you know, train them, uh, put up with them, whatever it is, right? You've got to go through that process. That's the, that's one little test bed. The second one is managers take holidays, you know, believe it or not. Um, we do take breaks, right? So why not have test windows? Why not actually, you know, if this, if this is in Europe, they take a month off in July or August, right? Don't we all wish we lived in Europe again? Oh, yeah. Um, and when they take the month of August off, who's their backup? Who sits in for them? How are we going to, and by the way, we as a management team, how are we going to pressure test that person in the new gig, right? Mm -hmm. How are we going to open their eyes up to it? Um, so, you know, that's the little, the test. They're not, you know, I talked about, you can see the potential coming. You can understand the things and test them out performance collateral initiatives and ecosystem acceptance. You can give them little roles like own a small team, give them a project. Um, we have, and one of the things we've done from a retention perspective is we've created, uh, you can't have a culture called project, sorry, a project called culture, but we actually have a culture project called Destination BMC. Now, Destination BMC, which is, you know, things like this, is no manager owns an initiative. All the initiatives are owned by individual contributors. So the woman in sales initiative, the, um, we have a cooking class initiative, we have all these, and I know Gong does a bunch of these as well, right? But all the initiatives, uh, there's a buddy program. So when a new person comes into the company, who's your buddy? And you volunteer to be a buddy. Um, there's all these different programs. Managers don't own any of them. They're all owned by individuals. And you can watch people perform or, you know, take on responsibility because ultimately when they become a manager, that's what you're going to ask them to do is take on a group of people, a set of personalities and some you know, corporate responsibility. So there's little tests you can take to identify potential in your organization. You know, how do they perform in a QBR? Are they a coach? Uh, are they a, uh, or a QSR? How do they, are they a coach? Are they constantly engaged? Do they drift off, sit in the corner and eat peanuts from a jar? I mean, what are they doing when they're in these, you know, because the, the minute you promote them, everyone's going to go, well, that guy's, you know, that guy Devin's a clown. Last QBR we had, he sat in the corner and, and ate jelly beans. I mean, you, you, little tests that you're doing along the way. Um, uh, uh, Devin's laughing, everybody. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm thing. laughing because I was going to say, plot twist, Devin becomes Sheena's intern who doesn't there get hired full time. <laughs> <laughs> that's She's the like, story I'm going to be a manager, but that's don't the story we're creating. <laughs> I've been known to sit in the back of class and make jokes, but never during a QBI, never during a QBI. <laughs> but that, that, I hope that helps, um, Sheena. It, it, yeah. it actually, you know, the, the, being a sales manager is a really complex job, right? It, it, it's maybe trivialized by a lot of people, but, but you know, especially if you're a first-time, um, you know, first-line first, first line sales manager, because if you, again, if, if you've got a one to six or um, span of control, so you've got six ICs, two of them are, you know, 10 year Two of them are getting there and two of them are new. You're having to manage all this movement in your team and then you get the surprise departure. So then you got to go and recruit and you got to leave mm -hmm. them alone for a bit so you can recruit. So you're always trying to spot and pick out whether you're the RSM or the person above. Who's your successor? 
right? Mm-hmm. Who's developing into that role? Because it might not necessarily be the team itself reps. I have reps here that are 20 years of selling that are ICs, individual contributors. They don't want to yeah. be a manager. Yeah. That's, they're professional salespeople. That's what they do. What I love about what you described is that identifying potential is not like something that is just like if you feel it in your gut or like that person looks like me. No, you laid out like specific tests and opportunities for the person to prove out that yes. potential. So like I think that's what's really great about what you described. And, and, and you, this, it's amazing how many times uh, – so in a 12-week operating rhythm on a given quarter, there are windows that everybody has in their operating structure, Right. So if you're doing pipeline generation or you're doing your QSR or you've got a week six deal review, give the IC that you think has got potential a challenge, right? Hey, we've got a PG event coming up in three weeks' time. It's going to be based around this topic with some training. I want you to get with the enablement team. I want you to structure and build the training. I want you to run the PG event. And, and some of them will, you know, again, if they're professional ICs that just want to stay in that world, they'll say, not my gig. I'm selling for me. I'm driving my number, I'm going to beat my quota. Others will say, here's my test. Here's my opportunity. I'm going to go for it, right? And that's, you don't, one isn't right and one isn't wrong. It's just helping you qualify the talent that's coming through the system. Well, yeah, you don't want a whole team full of folks who don't want to go to management and you don't want a whole team of folks who just want to, you know, and vice versa. So It creates a bit of friction. Like if you promote somebody, like again, first line manager promotion, the other five, if you promote the, the person out of the team to manage the same team, that's a really tricky dynamic. Right. So one day you were their peer, the next day you're their boss. And if you're the person that applied for the gig and didn't get it, then of the rest right. of the management needs to understand you better find another role for that person because they're going to leave. Mm-hmm. All right. They're not going to want to work for their peer or with their peer necessarily. Right. It's delicate. You got to be careful with that situation. I, you know, when it comes to recruiting, it's kind of interesting we were talking about that. I've got, the, I've got a couple of notebooks that I use, but I have, you know, and even when I run, I have, I do 25 one-on-ones, 30-minute uh, one-on-ones, so about 14 hours a week I dedicate to one-on-ones, not wow. with my leadership team. Oh, wow. All right, so, and on Fridays, I call it Gratitude Friday. On Fridays, I'll do, I'll, I'll get the managers to roll up a list of who do I need to thank Right, and I'll take three hours every Friday. And I'll try to ring them if I can. I'll email them, and I'll just whatever the reason I'm thanking them is, I do I do a thank you. Right, but the one on ones, the skip level or low level one on ones, are typically based around the nine box. So if you've got fifteen hundred salespeople and you want you know less than ten percent, so that's five to seven percent of your talent um, being in the one box, imminently promotable. So out of 1,500 people, you're talking 75 individuals, you know, and some of them might be ICs and some might be managers. So the, I do monthly, I have a rotation, a monthly and a quarterly rotation of these one-on-ones to get at the top talent, right? So they get time with the CRO, but I get time with them as well. And the one-on-one is 30 minutes of what I call a 10, 10, 10. 10 minutes of tell me what's going on in your life. Let's just have a chat. You know, we just brainstorm, we muck around, we, you know, we talk about the dogs, the weather, whatever. We don't talk about politics or religion. And then we have 10 minutes where we talk about what's going on with their job right now and what they're working on and what, what's important. And then we have 10 minutes on what's going to happen next, all right, for them and their career. And they have to come with a one-pager that says, you know, why Sheena, why Devin? And then we also create a champion, an internal champion plan. And the internal champion plan is just saying, who's important to you in your career? Who do you think is important to you in your career? And then we go, does that person, can they spell your name? Or would they, you know, die on the highway for you because they think you're amazing? We sort of rank them, all right? So what that 10, 10, 10 gives the person is just a window to share with me a little bit about them, a little bit about their gig, and a little bit about where they want to go. And then they leave behind with me their why and their champion plan, internal champion plan, and it lets me navigate and get a view of what they're thinking. And it's 25 people, but it, it, I love it, and they love it too. It's actually, it becomes a cultural thing, right? This just becomes a way of, well, we're, we're a hierarchy, but we're flat, right? It's kind of like that. Okay. All right, Jason, we're going to ask you the same question that we ask all of our guests to wrap up, which is, how would you describe sales in one word?
He's pondering off into the distance, maybe Got looking like, at his dog for inspiration. Um, what my guts are challenging, my head said rewarding, my heart says passion. But I, I don't know. I mean, honestly, and the shirt says believe. So no, we got well, a nice trifecta yeah, there. Me. <laughs> Seriously, like, you probably can't see it up here, but I've got unstoppable, I've got innovative, I've got agile, I've got passionate, I've got determined. Those are words that on my backdrop that every day when someone talks to me at work, they're right behind me. Yeah, I love it. I like it. Well, Jason, it's been fantastic. It is uh, 5 p.m., I think, your time, or at least maybe a little after. So it's the weekend's getting started. 520 Friday. <laughs> uh, well, let's get you out of here. Go get a, a pint, whatever it is uh, whatever uh -huh. it is you do. So enjoy uh, the weekend. I want to say thank you, though, honestly, for, thank you. for thank you. dropping knowledge for us today and our listeners. And so we thank you. Have a good weekend, and uh, hopefully we talk again soon. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you so Have much. Have a great weekend.